Okay, let's go ahead and get started for today. Welcome back to Physics 110. We made it. We got a really great day for you today and a really busy week. So be prepared to definitely stay until the end of the class period for both classes as well as kind of just we're going to be moving along and covering a lot of content. So can I just get a quick read before we get started? You had to do the Quizlet over the weekend. I promise I won't ask a follow-up about this, but I just want to see where you're at. Give me a thumbs up, medium, or down on how you felt about taking that Quizlet so far. Uh, wow, that is fantastic. I haven't gotten a single thumbs down. Are you being honest with me? Nobody's world came crashing down when they had to do a take-home exam? Huh. Yeah, okay. The expert TA was pretty brutal last week. That's probably a little bit unfair for sure. And maybe there will be some opportunities to make some of that up. It was really hard because we had trigonometry, but we didn't actually end up covering it in class. But we will cover trigonometry in class this week, so that will hopefully help us all get up to speed. But yeah, I recognize that that one was a little unfair, and I do apologize for that. I'll try to be better in the future. Uh, we, I got my eye on it. I, I, I hear you. I hear you. So if you want to stick around to talk about expert TA in the office hours, that'll be available for you. But the next one should not be as hard. It's not like they're all going to be that hard. That one was a anomaly. Okay. This week we have a deployment on Friday. Just very similar to the last one. You all had a lot of fun. It was a real blast. That last one is not due, but the one this week will be due. It'll be based on a little bit of accuracy, but also just sort of a little bit of in-class work like you did in the last one. And there's an expert TA homework assignment this week, which should be doable. And then we're right back on track. Also, the Unit 3B stuff I fell a little behind over the weekend on. Um, I sort of, I guess I got sidetracked with other projects, but it will be posted tonight on YouTube. And all of the pre-class quizzes have been created. It's just ready to be released. Just needed to do some final edits to the video before I released it all. So if you're one of those people who likes to work ahead, that'll definitely be available to you by the time you wake up tomorrow. Um, so thanks for granting me your grace in that spot. Today we are going to end up doing quite a few labs. We're going to do three different labs that have to do with forces. But first I want to give you a small overview of forces. So if you're one of those people who likes to take notes, maybe take out a notebook. It'll be about a page of notes that you can keep track of, but also if you just want to listen, you can do that, or it'll also be available for you to rerun on YouTube, hopefully assuming that all my technology works out. For Unit 3, we are dealing with a new idea. We're moving away from motion, although this is definitely related to motion. The idea that we're dealing with now is forces, where a force is a push or pull on an object. I'm sure that you can imagine some situations where you pushed or pulled something. For example, here I have a cart, right? And if I push on it, we see that something happens to its motion. I can push on it and it will start moving or stop moving. So forces are related to motion, but they're a little bit different because we're talking about what something feels rather than how it appears to us in physical space. So this thing can be pushed on by me and therefore it is experiencing a force. This special kind, this first kind of force that I just demonstrated will give a special kind of name. There's many different special kinds of forces that we'll deal with in this class. The most basic and simplest one is called an applied force. And we use capital F to denote any force, that's the variable. And if it's an applied force, we will put a little a subscript next to it. So an applied force is just a general name for any push or pull that is done by some person or some thing onto an object. If you don't know what to call a force, you can call it an applied force. But there are other kinds of forces as well that we will begin to become familiar with. We're going to test three of them out today. And the first one we're going to look at is called the gravitational force. This one should also feel very familiar to you because it's acting on you right now and it acts on you all the time. We call it F sub G. The gravitational force is the push or pull that causes objects to accelerate toward the center of the Earth. 
So gravity is acting on this thing. The only reason it's not falling is because I'm applying a force against it. And if I let go of it, gravity will be the only force that acts and it will be pulled down toward the center of the Earth. Gravity always points to the center of the Earth because it has to do with the mass of an object. And the Earth is quite massive. Tennis ball, not so much. So we'll learn about that gravitational force in just a sec. Another name for this is the weight force, and we'll talk more about that too. Some other forces that you will deal with are something called a normal force. This one is kind of hard to wrap your head around. We'll call it F sub N. And the normal force is not called the normal force because it's a normal thing that you experience on a normal day. That's actually not even close to what it means. It's called a normal force because in math class, the word normal means something very specific. In geometry class, if anybody says that there's a normal angle or 20 degrees from the normal, they are talking about a right angle. They're talking about a perpendicular angle. So in math class, normal means perpendicular. And that's why sometimes you'll see the normal force also written as the perpendicular force. Sometimes people will call it a perpendicular force. And what the normal force does is it opposes gravity in most cases to push back at a right angle out of a surface. So for there to be a normal force, you must have a surface below the object. Let's take another look at our tennis ball. Previously, when there was no surface below it, it falls to the center of the earth because only gravity is acting on it. But if I put a surface below the tennis ball, gravity is definitely still acting on it. Gravity is acting on all of us all the time. But it's not falling anymore. And that's because there is a surface perpendicular force that is opposing that. It's pointing directly at a 90 degree angle out of the table. And so if I have my table and my tennis ball, it'll definitely feel a downward force of gravity but it will also feel an upward force of the normal force from this surface. And notice that that's at a 90 degree angle. That is what normal means. You will be tested on that question on the pre-class quiz for next class. It's going to have it say what, what makes the normal force the normal force. And it's going to be a multi-select problem, and it'll say something like, it's called the normal force because I normally feel it all the time. Don't select that one. That's the wrong one. It's going to say, the normal force always points up. That's actually not true either. The normal force always points at a 90 degree angle from whatever surface is demonstrating that force. So let's go ahead and try to think about the normal force in just one other way. I said it's got to be at a 90 degree angle from a surface and it opposes other forces. So instead of thinking about the normal force pointing up, I'm going to push on this wall right here. I'm going to push into it and it's going to apply a normal force out at a 90 degree angle. Let's watch if you can see the normal force. I'm going to push. See if you can see the wall pushing back on me. Three, two, one. Do you see it pushing me backward? August wants to see it again. I push and it pushes me backward. Right? You want to see me lay out? See my core workout? Uh, so in that case, we had a normal force, but it didn't point up. It pointed at a 90 degree angle from the surface. And there will be cases where we have to think the normal force doesn't point up it points 90 degrees, okay? So that one will probably end up coming up in a, in a couple of class periods, but that's a really tricky one to wrap your head around. So keep that in mind for the normal force. The other ones that we will talk about in this class in physics one is called a tension force. This is a special kind of force. It is different from the others. 
because it must be transmitted through some kind of medium, some kind of rope or cable. And especially what makes the tension force unique is that it will always pull. It will always involve you pulling on a string or a rope or a cable or a medium. There is no possible way that I can push an object along by pushing on this rope. Here, Tyler, hold this. All right, I'm going to give you a good solid push. Did you feel it? No. no, you didn't. But now you do, and we could have a tug of war, and of course I would end up winning, but in time you'll grow, young boy. <laughs> Attention force has to involve pulling through some kind of medium, and that medium is a non-stretchable medium, okay? This medium cannot stretch. So once you have some tight string, it's taut, and that's how you transmit the tension force. We'll gain some more practice with that soon. There are two more forces that I would like to mention. There it is. The fifth is called a spring force. That we will call FS. Many people call the spring force an elastic force. And for there to be a spring force, you have to have some spring-like object. But it doesn't have to be a coiled spring like this. It could be a trampoline. It could be a bungee cord. It could be the elastic band in your undies for all that I care. But what's unique about a spring force is that the spring force depends on how much you stretch it. So right now I stretch this spring a little bit, and it's pretty easy. I'm so strong. But if I stretch it a little bit more, it's getting a little bit tougher. And if I really stretch it a lot, eventually I won't be able to overpower this spring. So there's a very special formula that constitutes the spring force. We'll learn about it today. And the main thing that you need to know is that the more that you stretch or even compress a spring, the more force that it will demonstrate to try to restore itself back to its original state. Now, we're only going to deal with elongated, elongating springs in this class, but another example of a spring that might compress is the shocks in your car. Those are little springs that hold your car up when you hit all the main potholes that we all experience all the time. And when your, your chassis or your car goes down, those springs get compressed a little bit and they push the opposite way to try to restore it back to its original state. The last one that we're going to need to think about for this unit is the friction force, F, F. This one should feel pretty intuitive. This is the force that prevents an object from moving. It resists an object's motion. There are technically two kinds. There's one kind that slows objects down. So that would be like that one, right? I slid along the ground and friction eventually caused me to come to a stop. But there's also friction for objects that are not moving that prevents them from moving. So this cup right here, I'm going to tilt this a little bit so that gravity pulls down on it, but it's not sliding along, it's just staying there. And that's because there's friction. Friction's preventing it from moving. And eventually, you know, if we give it a little bump, maybe it'll move a little bit, but friction causes it to stop moving. You also experience friction when your car tires grab onto the road. In fact, for every single step that you take, the fact that there's friction there is what causes you to move forward. If you were walking on a perfectly smooth sheet of ice with zero friction, you wouldn't end up going anywhere, and you'd just be doing the running man, you know? So, running man's a lot easier on frictionless surfaces, by the way. So these are the six forces that you'll need to think about for the practice problems and that we're going to learn about today. Now, let's break into one of these... Um, practices here. So, Nate, could you please hand out a lab notebook entry for each student for today's lab? We got a fun one with a lot of new equipment today. If you don't need one, please tell Nate that you're a tablet person. The first force that we're going to explore is the gravitational force. And another name for this is the weight force. So, before I tell you the name of the lab, 
I will wait for Nate to finish handing out the rest of the sheets. Good one. Thanks. This lab is called Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Anybody know what that is? Wait, wait. A joke? Wait, 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 don't tell me is an NPR show. You kids need to grow up. This little old man Dan over here. It's an NPR trivia show that on Sunday mornings, it used to be my recovery show back when I was your age on Sunday mornings, so I don't know what, I don't know what you all spend your time watching. And it's kind of a nerdy little play on words right there. So today we're going to learn about the weight force. Please go ahead and put that down as your lab name. And before I jump into writing down the lab notebook entry, because I'm going to give you a little bit of help this time around just to make sure we're all on the same page, I just want to show us a little bit about uh, this new program called Logger Pro. So if I could get each person to wiggle the mouse on their computer, please. Wake up your computer. There we go. And down at the bottom, you will find a little icon that says Logger Pro. It has a caliper and a little graph. Nice. And it's down here, Logger Pro. Make sure that you go ahead and click that and open it up. Very nice, very nice. This program will collect data for us. It will automatically put it in, so it's a little bit like Capstone. It'll collect the data for us from this object right here, which is called a force sensor. But before we start measuring forces, we're going to have to hook this device up that can connect the force sensor to the computer. So everybody find this gray box on your table, and if you're a computer person, hand it to the person to the right so that they can start looking at the equipment. Computer people, you're on the computer. Experimentalists, you're the ones working with the equipment today. This is a LabQuest Mini. What this will do is it will help the force sensor talk to the computer. And if you look at your LabQuest Mini, you should see there's a light on there. What color is the light? Is it red or is it green or orange? If it's red, anybody got a red light? Oh, wow. Last class set you up for success. If it ever does go red, you can unplug this and plug it back in, and your light should go from red to orange to green. Now what we need to do before we put in our force sensor is I want you to take a look at the force sensor. And on the front, you see it says 10N or 50N. Can you please make sure your switch is on the 10N side? Switch it to 10N. And what does that N stand for? Newtons. Exactly. We're talking about Newtons, which has the unit capital N. And that is the unit for force. Every single time that you measure a force, you will measure it in Newtons. And a Newton actually has some other more common units hidden away inside of it. It is actually the combination of one kilogram times one meter per second squared. Really, a Newton only involves mass and acceleration being combined. But it's such a common thing that we'll be using Newtons every time for our forces. So now that you're on the 10 Newton setting, that means that's the maximum that this thing's going to measure. I want you to take it and plug it into channel one on your LabQuest. Computer people, watch your computer and see if something happens when they plug it in. If a prompt comes up, make sure that you hit use sensor settings. And now in the bottom left, there should be a little thing that reads out the force to you. Let's just go ahead and play with this for a sec. Third experimentalist who has not had a chance to do anything, hand the force sensor to them and go ahead and give it a little donk. Donk. Go ahead and push on it a little bit, pull on it a little bit, and have your computer person try to figure out what the pattern is. What happens when you pull on it? What happens when you pull on it? Kind of hard. What happens when you push on it? What happens when you push on it? Kind of hard. We're talking about this little hook at the bottom. 
So try to figure out what the pattern is. Troubleshoot some stuff for me. <laughs> See if you can get this to this one to work. Maybe restart Logger Pro or don't. And if not, you could grab another force sensor from the other classroom. It's just that one, I think. Okay. So what happens? What what happens if I pull on it? Positive force. What happens if I push on it? Negative force. Okay, so this thing can sense direction. That's because force is a vector. What I need each group to do is grab the ring stand that's at your table, position it such that you have a rod over the top of the ring stand, grab your force sensor, and attach it to the rod. So that it's basically vertical. Did you get it, Nate, or no? Yeah. Nice. Just restarted it. So grab your force sensor and get it on that rod right there so that you have a vertical hook. I don't want it at an angle. I want it to be as vertical as possible. You can secure it with this little screw on top. It doesn't need to go through the hole on the rod or anything like that. got your equipment secured. Now what we are going to do is currently this thing, take a look at your numbers, ask your computer person, are we reading a force right now? Do you have some numbers there? All right, well we need to make sure that it's, it knows that this has got nothing on it. In other words, we need to zero this piece of equipment. We need to set a zero point, and the way that we do that is we go up to the top, and we hit this little zero button, set zero point. So I want nothing hanging on there. Don't let any, don't let it touch. Don't blow on it with a gust of wind. Just go ahead and hit zero and it's gonna think for a sec. And now it'll zero out. Now it knows that this right here is the, the baseline that we're gonna measure from. Okay, the next thing that we need to do, find your mass hanger. We're gonna put a, a, a mass hanger on here and go ahead and just put it on. Okay, we notice that the force goes up, but gravity always points down. So should this number be positive or negative? It should be negative. So we need to tell our force sensor that instead of down being positive, I want to reverse it so that positive is up. The way that you do that is you go up to this little button right here and click set up sensors. Click it. Find your force sensor in channel one, click that picture again, and there should be an option to reverse the direction. And just make sure that that box is checked and you're good to back out of here afterward. And now your number should be negative. We getting a negative, everyone? Maybe negative 0.5 or so? Roughly about there, good. So. Let's take a look at what the lab will be. Actually, I want to show you one more thing before I switch my HDMI. Let's just put 100 grams on there. So find, find some mass to put on there. 100 or 200, something like that. So I got some extra mass on mine. Just toss something on there. No worries. It happens to me all day long. 
and you'll see that my number is wiggling a little bit. It's wobbling between 2.437 all the way down to 2.434. And so you could just read that number and you'd be pretty close, but actually we want to take an average. So the way Logger Pro works is you can go ahead and hit this collect button up at the top and I want everybody to just hit it right now and it'll take your data for you. You'll see that mine's sort of swinging up and down, probably because my mass is swinging a little bit like a pendulum. But eventually it sort of levels out, it looks pretty even, and now what you can do is you can just take the average by hitting this one two up at the top. You just hit that one two, that's the statistics button, you should get a mean value, and when you're doing this lab, that is gonna be what I want you to read out. I don't want you to just pick the number down here because it's gonna be different than what your average is. So make sure that you always do a full 10 second run for each time, each data point that you collect. Doesn't take that long, but it will get you better results. Okay, now I'm gonna switch over to talk about the lab notebook entry because uh, after grading the last one, I realized that I maybe had misguided you a little bit and wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page. So if it ends up being a little bit boring to you, I apologize, but we're just gonna make we're just gonna make sure that we all know how to do the lab notebook entry one more time before I never help you with it again. So everybody's got their lab notebook entry. Today's lab is called Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. You already got that listed. And I'm not gonna waste your time brainstorming about the physical quantities for this one because we don't have too much time. For this experiment, we will obviously be using mass and the force sensor. So we can use mass as one of our physical quantities. The symbol is M and its units are actually kilograms, not grams. It's the only variable that doesn't have the base unit as its standard. And the other one is going to be force, which we use a capital F for the symbol and that'll be measured in Newtons. Now between these two, mass and force, which one do you think we will be very easily able to control such that we can make it our independent variable? Wow, look at all the participation today. Wow, Zoe. Mass, that's right. So we'll make that our independent variable. Sorry to everyone that I couldn't choose. I'll come back and cold call on you later. Uh, now, for your problem statement, you should be able to set this up. How does the dependent variable depend on the independent variable? In other words, how does force depend on mass? And this is actually a pretty easy lab because there's really not too much different that we're gonna do. Our initial conditions, there's none. We're all gonna start from the same place. But there is something that's gonna be constant. So I'll write constant right here. Does anybody know what's gonna be constant for the gravitational force, Jason? What's that? Negative 9.8 meters per second squared is the value of negative G. Wait, why is it negative G? Okay, so I, yep, I like that you included the negative. Here, let me actually write this out very carefully so that it's consistent. What I would write is G equals 9.8 meters per second squared. Now stick with me. This is just the, the value of G. It's the same as the acceleration due to gravity that we dealt with last class. So when I write G, I also mean A sub G. Those are the same thing, actually. The book will often refer to it as G. And this is just the magnitude of the number. It's just saying the value of G, that constant, is always 9.8 when you're on Earth. But if I want to think about G as a vector, if I want to put a little arrow here and say, now I also care about which way it points, now you have to include the sign. So this one gets people a lot, but the, the rule is, if it has a vector arrow above it, you have to have a plus or a minus in front of it. If there's no vector arrow above it, you can just put the number. Thank you. Thank you for the really good question. Very thoughtful. And that's going to be constant for all of us, no matter where we are on Earth, basically. So just to be clear, I'm going to write what I just wrote as well. G as a number equals 9.8. G as a vector 
equals negative 9.8, because vectors care about direction. This is also just a notational thing, so as long as you know that g points down and it's 9.8, I think you're getting it. Now, the sketch of the experimental setup, this one is actually where a lot of people ended up losing a point or two, and I apologize for taking away a point, but we got to make sure that we read the instructions. So let me help you out with this one. I'll go ahead and draw what we have here. I'm going to draw our ring stand. Oop, that was not a good line. There we go. And it's got a little rod, and off of the rod there is a force sensor, right? And it's got a little hook, and on that hook I'm going to hang my mass. There we go. So that's a drawing of what we have right here. You can see it in front of you on the front table. But that's not everything that needs to be included in a sketch of your experimental setup. We could also draw, you know, this thing feeds into a computer, right? Here's a computer, and it's going to be using Logger Pro today. Maybe you want to draw out your keyboard of your laptop. Let's see Glazer Tutoring draw that. But that's still not everything because it says including all measured variables and measurement tools. So you need to label where these variables come up. There's only two in this experiment, force and mass. So I need, a, I need you to write where the force is. What we are measuring today is the force of gravity. That's where the force of gravity shows up. It pulls down on that thing. And now I know that that's what we're measuring. And where does the mass show up? It shows up right here inside of that hanger. So I'm going to put some mass on, and it's going to feel some force. Ah, now I know exactly what we're looking at. A lot of people on their experimental setup drew a ruler and a car and a stopwatch. You know I know what you mean. But you didn't draw where velocity showed up as an arrow. You didn't draw position with the letter X anywhere with a dot. You didn't put time with a T next to the stopwatch. You didn't put a double-headed arrow for the acceleration. So you got to remember to always put all your variables in there. Any variables that are listed at the top, you should somehow be able to show in the diagram, in the, in the sketch. This one's even a little simpler than the ones that we did previously. So I can always check yours before you turn it in as well if you want me to check it. So something like that would make sense for this one. The other one, the reason why I'm doing this is because these are two things that I consider easy points, but a lot of people got dinged on. I didn't mean to have to do that to you, but let's draw out a uh, graphical prediction. It's going to have force in newtons on the vertical axis, mass in kilograms on the horizontal axis. And there are two things that a lot of people were forgetting. Well, I guess there's three. First off, it says axis and units. So if you didn't have units, you lose the full points on this question. Don't mean to be too harsh, but there's really no excuse to not include units in a science class. I know that you know this and perhaps just overlooked it, and that's OK. Um, but we also need to have an explanation of why you think it's going to do this. So some people hadn't even drawn a graph. Obviously, you need to draw some kind of graph. I'm going to draw something silly just so that I don't copy whatever you have. I'm going to go like this. Okay? Maybe I think that mine's going to look like that. It's silly. That's not what it's going to do. You know that. But it'll do something along those lines. And then you'll say, as I put more mass on, I feel more weight. Right? So that's why I'm guessing that it's going to be like that. Because I have a little bit of intuition. It's almost bulking season. I'm putting on some mass. I know it feels more weight. So that's my guess. You can talk about it amongst your group, but a lot of people did not even include an explanation. And that's just an overlooking of the instructions. And I don't like taking away points for that kind of thing. So let's make sure that we carefully include everything that's required for each question. So you got to make sure you put some kind of writing. I don't care what you write. I will probably just check it unless it's really something ridiculous and you're not taking it seriously, but I think you are. And so that's how you do both of those. 
Thank you for letting me go back through that just to make sure that everybody feels a little bit caught up. I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave that back up in a moment. I just want to go to the experimental data so we can know what we're collecting. Our independent variable, that's mass, kilograms, deep end in his force, newtons. And I want your mass to span a range of, say, 500 grams or so. Of course, we'll be measuring in kilograms. So right now you have a hanger on there. What does that hanger say? How much does that hanger have for mass? It's got something on there. You should double check. Let's read it. So it's 50 grams, right? And if I have 50 grams, stick with me for, you know, two more minutes here. Ask yourself, don't ask your neighbor, how many kilograms is 50 grams? Think to yourself for a sec. This, this is one that we should be able to figure out, okay? So just think and figure it out and write it down if you want. Or a thousand, multiply, is that what it is? Hmm. Okay, who's got an answer? Chelsea. 0.05. It's 0 0.05, and the way that we did that is by asking yourself, in one kilogram, how many grams is there? There's 1,000 grams. We do 50 divided by 1,000. That moves our decimal place over three times. And I get 0 0.05 kilograms. I am not worried about the sig figs for right now. For all of you who want to go be dentists or PAs or something like that, or exercise science coaches or whatever you're going to do, you probably don't need to have the metric system memorized and know how to transmit back and forth between these units. But what I do need you to walk away from my class knowing, I don't actually care if you know how to do it. I just care if you know how to find the answer when I'm not here anymore, okay? And what I would recommend, if you are ever confused about something like this, is you type it into Google. And you say, how many kilograms is 50 grams? And it'll do it for you, okay? So when you're a medical doctor and you need to convert cc's to milliliters or something like that because you're gonna give someone a COVID shot, you need to know how to figure out where that answer is. You don't need to know it. You need to figure out how to figure out where it is. This is the modern age of referential knowledge. All you need to know is where the answer is. You don't need to know the answer, okay? So for these masses, we're gonna skip the 50, you know, we're gonna have it on there, but we're gonna go a little higher. Maybe go up by 100 grams or 200 grams each time. So that means that you should have maybe 0 0.150, 0 0.250, 0 0.350, 450 grams, and 550 grams, something like that. Or if you want to go up by 200s, that's fine. But somewhere that spans a decent range, your person on a computer will hit the collect button, you'll wait 10 seconds, you'll take the average, and you'll get your numbers in here. We'll see if you end up getting the correct graphical prediction. Please double check to make sure that your team all talks about the graphical prediction before we get started with the experiment, and then we will get going. Are there any questions before I get started? All right, let's get it popping. All right, let's come together, squad. Fam, let's, let's take a look at this. So what you should have for your raw graph is you should have a graph that goes as mass in kilograms and force in newtons, and it should have a couple of dots, and it should have been pretty darn linear. There we go. And can I just get some numbers, Tyler B? What was your slope? Um, negative 9.975. Negative 9.975. And what was your intercept? Negative 0 0.0122. 0 0.0122. Okay. Everybody's numbers should be different, but I like it when you write it down right next to the graph what the linear trend line looks like. Okay? Now I'm going to give you the answers to the notebook entry so that we can do it together so that when you get your next grade on grade scope, you don't have to go, why did I get those points off? 
So I'll give you one more walkthrough. This is the last time that I'm going to explicitly do it in class. So if it's boring to you, please just sit tight. But I'm cer certain that there's some people in this classroom that will want this. So you should have force in newtons on the y-axis, mass in kilograms on the x-axis, and you should draw the general trend. All of you should have something that looks like that with the way
on it or pushing on it. Draw all external forces as arrows with the correct size and direction. Size and direction. So let's think. What are some forces that might be acting on this? Does anybody have an idea of one force that might be acting on it? Mo? Gravitational force. Gravitational force. I like to draw the gravitational force in blue because the Earth is blue, and without the Earth, we wouldn't have gravity. So we're going to draw the gravitational force, and it will always act down. Usually it's the easiest one to start with, so I'll draw an arrow for that, and I'll label it FG. Points down, because that's where the center of the Earth is. But this thing currently is not only experiencing gravity. If it was, it would be like the tennis ball. But this one is not experiencing what the tennis ball is experiencing. Instead, this object is not moving, and therefore we would say that it is in equilibrium. And when we are in a state of equilibrium, what that means is all forces in either the vertical direction or the horizontal direction will cancel each other out. All vertical forces cancel. And all horizontal forces cancel. And there are two kinds of equilibrium. There's a way that you can know if you're in equilibrium or not just by thinking about the motion of the object. The first is that if it is not moving at all, we would call that static equilibrium. Static EQ is what I'll write. Or if an object is moving, but it's moving at constant velocity. It's not speeding up or slowing down. Zero acceleration. We would call that a different state of equilibrium. That's dynamic equilibrium. Constant velocity equals dynamic EQ. So which state of equilibrium do you think this hangar's in right now? It's in static equilibrium because it's not moving, and therefore there must be another force that cancels out this downward force of gravity. Anybody have a thought of which of these six forces we could call the thing that's stopping this uh, hanger from falling, Lillian? Normal force. You could call it a normal force. Remember, for a normal force, we need to have a surface holding it up. I suppose I could see the argument if this hook is a surface, but we're going to try to stick with more like a flat surface, like the ground or a wall for the normal force. Good suggestions so that we can talk about it. Fabia? The tension force. I'm glad that someone else said this one also. Tension force is a great guess as well. But that's actually not the answer that I'm looking for either because, sure, there's tension in that hook. That makes sense. But you could push that hook if you wanted. We could push on it, right? And it would feel a force, unlike a string. You know, when I push on a string, it can't transmit that force. It can only pull. So you're right, it is pulling here. But in this case, I wouldn't call it tension either because the hook is a rigid object, unlike this non-rigid string. I'm really glad that we're talking about this so we can clarify the difference between these forces. So normal force requires a surface. Tension force requires a string. August, you got an idea. Is it applied force? We're going to call this one an applied force. Because we kind of don't know what else to call it. It's just something that's holding on to this, preventing it from falling. Now, let me be honest. If you would have said tension force or normal force, probably wouldn't have marked it wrong. It's really close, but we need to get down exactly when to say which of these, because trust me, I taught this last year and people were confused by the end of it because we were not clear enough. So let's just get it right. Applied force is if it doesn't fall in any other category, you can call it an applied force. Gravitational force requires Earth's gravitational field. Normal force requires a surface below or to resist a different force. Tension force requires a rope or medium that cannot be pushed but can be pulled. Spring force requires something that stretches, and the more you stretch it, the greater the force becomes. And friction force, we'll talk about that in a sec too, requires contact between two surfaces to resist motion.
So in this case, thank you August and everyone for your great contributions, really. I do value all of them. We're going to call this an applied force. And these two forces should be equal and opposite. One should point down, one should point up, and they should be about the same length. But it's kind of hard for me to tell, especially when I'm grading the work of students who have never done this before, it's kind of hard for me to tell if your arrows are the same length sometimes. So we're going to use a symbol to make sure that your teacher knows, and we're going to use a hash mark on these arrows to indicate that those two arrows are the same length. Single hash for that one. And so let's put that as a third note. Hash marks indicate equal length arrows. And now we have our first free body diagram complete. Mission complete. I just gave you the answers to this notebook entry. Now, technically, this week, we have a deployment due. We don't have a notebook entry due. But I'm just going to hint to you that I'm probably going to collect this one next week. Okay? So do not leave it like this brilliant student did in my last section, because this is going to be due. And I just gave you the answers. So if you were upset about your first grade that you got, he said, I can't believe I lost those points. Dr. Weller's so mean. He took away a whole point because I forgot to put the units. What the heck? Well, now you should have 15 out of 15 coming in, right? Because I just gave you the answers. As long as you can hold on to a piece of paper until next week, your life, you'll be happy because you'll get all the points. I'll be happy because it'll take me no time at all to grade. And then everybody's happy again. So what we need to do right now is take a break. 321, I appreciate your diligence. We are going to go the whole time today, so I'll see you at 326. Talk to you then. Distribute some stuff, Nate. Thanks. Can you put a box on each table and then put the weakest spring on one side of the table out of the box for one group, and then the, the thickest, strongest, most rigid spring on the other side of the table? Thank you.